All right, good morning, everyone. So it's uh, another Sunday morning. It's the start of week. And it's great to, to come to the church, just to spend a bit of time singing and hearing from God's word. So let's just uh, open this time in a word of prayer as we do that this morning. Dear Lord, we just uh, thank you once again for an opportunity to, to meet together. Lord, I thank you that you work in our lives and I just pray once again that you'll work amongst us today. Pray that you'll help us. Pray once again that if there's someone here that doesn't know you as their personal saviour, that you'll work in their heart and that they'll turn and put their trust in you. And those of us that know you, Lord, we just pray that you'll just once again encourage us and help us in our walk with you. And we just pray these things in the wonderful name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
them in, just to make sure they have room to be able to come in and have a seat. And if you're visiting with us, this is not normally where we meet. We're not normally in here. We're normally in the hall. Um, however, the fan is not working anymore, and so uh, we'd rather be in here where it's a little bit cooler. And uh, we're glad, just glad that you're with us. Now, a couple of things that will be coming up. In the near future, on the 18th of March, at 8.30 in the morning, uh, we're going to be meeting as a church and having some time of letterboxing. Uh, I'll let you know of the area and where we're all going to be meeting as the time approaches. Now, next Sunday, uh, we're going to have some, a couple of different things going on. Next Sunday evening, uh, my wife and I will not be here. We'll be here Sunday morning. Uh, but we're going away for our 25th wedding anniversary, spending some time away. Uh, but there will be church service on Sunday night like we normally have. Brother Pete will be bringing the message next Sunday night. And so um, that will be good. And then on Wednesday night, we may or may not be able to be part of the meeting on Wednesday night. It all depends on, uh, they say we have internet on the boat, but we don't know if we actually do or not. And so we have asked uh, Brother Josh Grunwald who's going to be bringing the Bible study on Wednesday night. And so we'll still have Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, like we always do. Um, so please be in your place and be encouraged by the Word of God. Because uh, it doesn't matter whether it's me or whoever is bringing the Word of God. It matters if the Word of God is preached, correct? Okay, good. And uh, we'll be looking forward to hearing about those services, but we're glad... Uh, that the Lord provided in that way. Now, as we're going to be away, um, if there's some of you who thought about it and would like to, uh, please see my wife. Um, Katie will be taking care of Tommy while we're away, because uh, the point of getting away is not to bring the children with us, right? Thank you. Uh, Bless you. Uh, so, if that's the case, if you want to help, and you know, Katie with an hour or something with Tommy, uh, please see my wife. In typical my wife fashion, she has a schedule with slots that you can sign up for, and all those types of things all ready to go, and what's going to take place, and who's going to be where, and uh, just she'll handle it. Just go see her, and I'm sure they'd appreciate that. Now, I think that's basically all the announcements for anything that's going on. Um, and after we're going to have a scripture reading in a moment, then we're going to have another hymn. Then right before the message, um, Katie and Josiah will be coming. They're going to be singing a special. Uh, it's going to be a it's a new song. Some of you may have heard it, you may not have heard it, uh, but I asked them to sing it as a special, so that way you can hear how it sounds. Because tonight, when we come back at, for church, uh, Josiah is going to lead the song and teach it to us. Right? We're going to learn a new song. Is that good? Yeah. Some of you want to learn it. Some of you are new. I don't like new. No more new. Uh, but it's a good song, very scriptural song, and it'll be good to learn and to be able to sing and praise the Lord. That. All right, so take your Bibles. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 4, and uh, verses 12 to verse, I believe, 19 will be the scripture reading this morning. So, Brother Josh, if you come. <coughs> Scripture reading for this morning is in 1 Peter and chapter 4. Mm. 1 Peter chapter 4, and we're starting in verse 12. <clears throat> Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. 
Sometimes having children in church can be a little bit noisy, but at least they're in church, right? I mean, we could be a church full of people that are all older and all those types of things. Oh, there's anything wrong with older people. We love you. <laughs> Fast becoming you. Uh, <laughs> uh, but a church with no young people or children is you know, only a few short years away from existing no more. And uh, we're just glad that God blessed us with a church that we have all age groups, right? Watch the thing like, how is going to get himself out of this one? I don't know. I'm just, just going to keep digging. Uh, no, we're glad that everyone's here and they can go and, and show us this time. Um, now, First Peter chapter 4. Uh, continuing on as we look at, continue looking at the Word of God here. And, uh, now, this passage of Scripture as it was read, there are some topics that are more enjoyable to listen to, and there's some topics, to be honest with you, as a preacher, as a pastor, they're more enjoyable to preach. I don't know about you, but I like preaching about salvation. I'm sure you like hearing about salvation, right? Yes. I like hearing preaching about forgiveness of sin and uh, being complete in Christ and all those type of things. And I'm sure we like hearing about those things. It's fun, nice to preach about heaven, isn't it? Where we're where we're going to be and uh, being with God forever. So all those types of things are great, but the minute we use start talking about the word suffering. We probably are going, eh, that's not my favorite topic, right? Uh, it's not something I want to sign up for today. Um, if there is a sign-up sheet, I would walk past that table and go, that's okay, I'm good, I will just keep going on. However, throughout the Word of God, it's very clear uh, that there is suffering as we walk in the Christian life, as we live. Matter of fact, Jesus told us not to be shocked by it. And so we're going to be looking at this idea of when a Christian suffers. Now, we're going to be finding out, as we say in this passage of Scripture, there's multiple different ways that you and I can suffer. Sometimes, suffering is our own fault. Right? Uh, suffering is a result of sinning or doing something that you shouldn't have been doing. Uh, that's not you know, suffering as Christ suffered. That's suffering because we did something and we deserve it. Uh, but sometimes you can be living the Christian life, doing exactly the best of your ability with the enablement of the Holy Spirit, 
to walk with God and do what you're supposed to be doing and, and live the life you're supposed to be living and you can still suffer. You can still go through difficulty. And so when that happens, there's some things in Scripture that we need to be reminded of and, and be brought to our mind to think about. Because to be honest with you, um, you know, one of the things that a job as, as a pastor is, is to prepare us. And, and you know, some, someone said, uh, uh, I think Brother Brian said a couple uh, weeks ago when we, when, you know, we had someone come to know Christ their Savior and, and the Lord was really working and doing so many different things, um, I believe he said, we should be prepared. There's probably going to be some suffering or some trials coming up in the very near future. You know, anytime God works, there's always opposition, isn't there? And so let's just look at this passage of Scripture, take some things on board, and just, you know, I don't know about you, but I'm not looking to suffer. I'm not happily, eagerly, fight, look, you know, let's go find a way I can suffer today. No, no, no. Uh, but as we walk with God, and as we see God begin to work and do things, we have some things that we can learn from this passage of Scripture. So, uh, and as he's talking to these believers, I don't know about you, but it doesn't seem to think that anything's changed from Bible times in some degrees. Some people think that the minute they accept Christ or Savior, they become a Christian, all difficulty ceases. All trials cease. And I even remember, you know, when some people come to know Christ or Savior, they think, oh, well, since sin is forgiven, consequence of the sin is, is gone. No. It doesn't happen that way. Uh, there are some things in life that once we do it, there's always going to be a consequence of that thing. I remember, many of you know my... my testimony of my story about my father who uh, was in the motorcycle gangs and he was a hitman and all those type of things and uh, one day when he was in prison and, and, and on death row a pastor went and visited him opened a bible, shared with him the gospel and at that time my father finally accepted Christ as his savior and I'll tell you this it did not mean when, when, when all this was at that moment when he accepted Christ as his savior the 32 or 33 people he had killed as a hitman was that all forgiven by God? So I don't know if I want to answer that one. That, that's a big one. It was. God forgave it all. Yeah. Did that mean they went, oh, you're forgiven by God. Let's open the doors and let you walk out of prison and go free. No. If they did, they're insane. You say, why? He did some actions that have a consequence that carry with it the rest of your life, whether your sins are forgiven or not. And so we, we need to be, be mindful of these things so, and, and begin to look at these things and say, you know what, living the Christian life does not exclude us from difficulty, does not exclude us from trials, does not exclude us from some suffering. Hey, it doesn't exclude us from sickness. We found that out, haven't we, in the, in the life of our church? It doesn't exclude us from sickness. Wouldn't that be nice? You said Christ your Savior, you're never sick, nothing ever happens. You know, it's kind of like what they portray in, in the TV and the cartoons where the rest of your life you're just laying back on a cloud while angels feed you grapes until you go to heaven. Uh, but that's not the case. That's just still not the case. And so as we begin to look at this passage of Scripture, we look at verse 12. It says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning your fiery trials, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. You know what Paul say, you know, Peter's saying? See, first thing, Christians, when you suffer, number one, Expect suffering. I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound encouraging, does it? He said, why are you counting it strange? Why are you saying, this? I don't know why I'm suffering. This is so unusual. I'm a Christian. I shouldn't be suffering. He said, yeah, don't think that way. Don't think it's strange. Don't, don't think it's odd. Uh, don't, don't be like, oh, well, you know, this will never happen to me. He, he's writing to those believers here who all of a sudden were going through some difficulty. By the way, in his day in life, did they go through difficulty? Oh, yes. I mean, in, in the Roman Empire, when, when, when Paul was telling us to pray, ever think about this, we've said this before, when Paul writes, pray for the king, did you ever pop in your mind who the king was? Probably Nero. The one who took Christians and like, used them as human torches. So you say, but I don't want to pray for the people in, the, in authority in our country. Well, they're not as bad as Nero. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know. Just pray for them. 
difficulties will happen. Expect it's going to come. And as, as we go on, hey, not expecting persecution can not prepare you for the realities of life. And what he's trying to tell these believers is, hey, listen, just be prepared. I don't know about you, but when you're prepared for something and it happens, it's a little bit easier to go through it, is it not? But when you show up to something and you're complete, have you ever been invited to something, you show up and you're just so not prepared for what was about to happen? And I've learned in life, whenever I'm around my father-in-law, whenever I'm in Mexico with my father-in-law where he's a missionary, uh, to always be prepared to expect the unexpected. You say, what do you mean? When they were in there, and by the way, I don't speak Spanish. I understand it very little. I can say <coughs> hi, I can say bye, I can ask where the bathroom is. That's about all I, all I can do. You know, where's the toilet? I can get that out, all right? Uh, but all of a sudden, I was minding my own business, sitting in church one day in Mexico, and my father-in-law gets up, he starts a service, he opens in a word of prayer, and he says, Now, Armando Jose, now I knew enough this, Armando is brother, or something close to, Jose, that's me. Okay, I knew that, is that right, Mercedes? Okay, good, I interpreted that right. And then I remember him saying something to the effect that Armando Jose was coming to lead the singing. And I just sat there. Because I thought, surely there's another Jose in the church. <laughs> he is not talking about me. There's no way he's talking about me. Number one, I can't sing. You know, it's not going to work. I don't know. I mean, my, my kids got it for my wife, not for me. Number two, lead the singing in Spanish. Mm. <laughs> Number three, I hadn't picked any songs. What was he talking about? And then he stops everything, looks straight at me and says... Armando Jose, and he looks at me, and he, then he switches to English. He goes, that's you, boy. Get up here. <laughs> what do you do? Yes, Dad. I get up there. And he hands me a hymn book, and he says, go. And I'm thinking, I don't know how to say 133 in Spanish. <laughs> he goes, but you know the single numbers, don't you? I said, yeah, maybe. And he says, okay. Him, Nario, him. I said, okay. So he's giving me a basic Spanish lesson on the spot. And I said, okay. Leonardo, uno, tres, tres. And he goes, they'll get it. And they all turned 133. And I was like, whoa. And he's, they started, my mother-in-law started playing, and he said, go. And I'm like, don't know how to pronounce these words, but here we go. I love the song in Spanish. And I said, that was that. Then a few weeks later, we show up to church. We're about five minutes from pulling into the church parking lot, or if you want to call it that driveway. He looks at me and he says, uh, oh, by the way, Joe, you're preaching this morning. <laughs> you see, how much time did you have to prepare? From that moment till he called me up to the pulpit, that was it. So after those two occurrences, I always had messages ready to go in my Bible. I'd already looked through the, the, the Spanish hymn book, and I had it all prepared. You say, why? It's, I don't like going into life unprepared. I like to like, know what's going on. I know, like to know what's expected of me, prepare for all the possible scenarios, and, and come into it prepared. You understand, that's what Peter is saying to us as believers. Don't come into difficulty, don't come into trials, don't come into suffering unprepared. Expect it to take place. Expect it going to happen. Another trial. Uh, Brother Pete, can you do me a favor? That little button by the aircon, can you smack it again? Just decide to shut off. All right. Turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. We'll look at verses 1 to verse 5. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into the grace, into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, 
because the, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. You know, know what he says? When you expect the trials, then the next thing we can find that we should be doing, now, uh, we should exalt in trials. And what does exalt mean? The word exalt literally means to feel or show triumph, elation, or jubilation. In other words, if you're expecting the trial, here's what he says. Remain joyful while going through it. I don't know about you, but we've all agreed that we would not joyfully, happily sign up for trials, would we? <coughs> but what are we told in scriptures? <coughs> to rejoice. You say, why? How could we rejoice in these? How can we rejoice in a difficulty? How can we rejoice in these different things? Well, because God has a purpose. See Romans chapter 5. That's what he was saying. He was saying, hey, uh, not only... It says, um, and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, not only so, but glory in tribulations. That's glory in them. I don't know about you, but the last time I had trials and difficulties, I don't think I was excited about it. Have you ever been sitting in a church and someone yelled, glory to God? You know what saying? You're in the middle of the trial. They, glory to God. Oh, what? Why? Because trials or tribulation is doing something in you. It, it has a work in you. What is it doing? It's bringing patience. Now, I don't know about you. Maybe you don't, maybe, but I do. I, I find I need patience. I, I tend not to be that patient. You don't believe me, ask my wife. She's been there for 25 years. She can probably tell you a few stories. But you know what? To get more pay be careful what you pray for. I remember one time praying, Lord, I, I need some patience. Would you please give me some patience? Oh, he did. Some trials along the way, too. You say, why? Trials work patience. Because you know what? When you're, when, you're, when you're going through some suffering, there's not a lot you can do. If you've ever gone through some difficulty and you're laid up in a hospital bed, it's really hard to do stuff. It really is. You know, it's kind of fun, too. Especially you know, the last time I was in the hospital, my eyes were still swollen shut. People would say stuff around me thinking I was asleep. I wasn't asleep. I just couldn't open my eyes. They were swollen. So I had fun just randomly making comments on conversations going on around me and shocking people to death. Like, they would jump and be like, oh, you're not asleep. I'm like, no, I'm not. And they would be like, oh. It was kind of fun. But I don't think that's what Joyce is talking about. As not only that, but what happens is, as tribulations work patience, patience and patience experience. Mm -hmm. You begin to grow. Yes. Mm -hmm. You begin to mature. You begin to say, you know what? Uh, God's brought me through this difficulty. And I never thought I could ever make it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever been through something. I, just, I don't think I can make it through this. I don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. But yet, through... Through trials, you get patience, and through patience, you get experience to know that God is with you even in the darkest night, as was sun. And an experience, what? Hope. I don't know about you, but all of us want hope. You want to have hope. Uh, an assurance of what is to be. But did you see the process you have to go through to get the hope? I don't know about you, but I want hope, but I don't know if I want to sign up for the process. Say, why? The end result of hope starts with tribulation. Mm -hmm. Then gives experience. Then, I mean, then patience. Then patience gives experience. Then as I ex get more experience in walking with God and seeing God work, I have more hope in what He can do. <coughs> and so, we should be able to exalt in suffering. Third thing, back in 1 Peter chapter 4, if I'm expecting suffering, and if I'm exalting in suffering, and, and, and rejoicing in suffering, and giving glory and tribulation, why? Because I see the process at works. that helps me then do the third thing, and that is evaluate suffering. Evaluate it. Look at verse 15. 
But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Now, I find that interesting. You see that list of sins? There's some things in there that you and I would be, oh yeah, that's wicked, that's, that's wrong, that's, that's bad. But do you see what he throws in there with it all? Say what? Murderers, thieves, evildoers, and what's the last one? Busybody. Now, would you consider a busybody or a gossip the same as a murderer? Sometimes, you know, as Christians we have... We look at some sins and we go, that one's not as bad as this one, don't we? Mm -hmm. and some of that meddles and other people's business. God's like, no, no, no. Both same. Both same. We say, why? Murder, I physically kill you. Uh, being a busybody, what do I do? I verbally kill your reputation. Mm -hmm. Same thing. And God puts them both in, the, in that, that context and you say, hey, evaluate your suffering. Sometimes what you need to do is you're going through difficulty, you're going through trial, you need to stop and evaluate. Am I in this situation because I brought it upon myself, because I have sin in my life, or I've done something that deserves to be in this position, or evaluate this. Let none of you suffer as, as verse 16. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian... Let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. So sometimes when you're going through suffering, what you got to do is evaluate to God, am I suffering now because of my own sin? Because I brought this on myself? Or am I suffering for simply following you? Yeah. There's a difference. Say what? If I'm suffering because there's sin in my life and I brought it upon myself, then I need to get some things right. I need to confess that sin and make it right and repent of that sin and turn to Christ and ask Him for forgiveness. I need it first John 1 John 1.9, yes? We confess our sin, He's faithful just to forgive us our sin, knowing what? And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Hey, that's not just salvation. Right? So we need to evaluate that and say, Lord, why am I suffering? Am I suffering because it's, it's me? I don't know about you, but sometimes you don't, we don't, that's the last thing we want to admit. Well, I think in the Christian life, we often portray the biggest enemy of living the Christian life is the devil. And I think that's the greatest lie the devil's probably ever told you. See, what do you mean? Your greatest enemy in living the Christian life is not the devil, it's you. It's your own flesh. It's me. You say, who stops Pastor Joe from walking with God like he should? Pastor Joe. Me. You say, why? Because I'm flesh. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I can bring suffering on myself. I, I'm really good at that. I can do that. It's one of my many skills, you know. <laughs> we all are can say that. We need to evaluate, hey, what I'm going through in my life is, do I need to fix something? Do I need to get back right with God? Do I need to say, hey, am I suffering as a Christian? By the way, there's different types of suffering as a Christian as well. You understand that? The Bible tells us to speak the truth in love, yes? I know a lot of people are suffering as a Christian because they're taking the right stand, but they're doing it in the wrong way. We need to be careful. So evaluate. Am I bringing this suffering upon myself? Or am I simply living obedient to the Scriptures? Because can I tell you something? The message of the Scriptures, the fact that we're all sinners, that we all need a Savior, that Christ paid for our sins that we cannot do anything to earn that salvation is not popular. It's not going to win friends and make, you know, it's not going to make friends. It's probably going to win enemies. Have you ever, I mean, why do I need a Savior? Well, because you're a sinner. I'm not a sinner. Yeah. You're not? Wow. First one I've met that way. You know, you start asking questions. I always ask the question, have you ever stolen anything? Oh, define stealing. Define stealing. <laughs> stealing is taking anything that's not yours. Right? I mean, have you ever... I, I've actually stolen <coughs> something and didn't know I did it. Matter of fact, youth camp, just past January. Pastor Luke gave me a notebook to keep scoring. 
put a pen in the notebook to keep scoring. Gave him the notebook back. This week I did an unusual thing. You know what an unusual thing I did? And my wife will laugh at this because she probably still doesn't consider it this way. I started cleaning my desk. You know, where I sit down and prepare my I started cleaning from this side. She probably looks at going, it's not clean. I never said it was clean, I said I started cleaning. And as I started cleaning, I lifted up a, a bunch of camp booklets. And what fell out of the camp booklet was a pen. It was not my pen. It's Pastor Luke's pen. The pen belongs in Tenham Sands, not in, May, in Cal Anger. And you know what I realized? Oops. I stole Pastor Luke's pen. And I didn't even mean to. So I said, what are you going to do? Uh, I'm gonna. I've got. I'm writing a thank you note for the workers that work at camp. So I'm gonna include his pen in it, and I'm gonna apologize for stealing his pen. And then I've got. I've got refills to his pen because I have pens just like his pen. So I'm gonna throw a couple refills in there and say, here you go. Like, I'm sorry, I stole your pen. You can do that, but you have to evaluate. Hey, is it is it because they're sin in my life, or is it because I'm actually living the Christian life, taking the right stands? doing the right thing, trying to follow God, trying to be obedient as I can, trying to warn people, trying to invite them to church, trying to see them come to know Christ their Savior, and just trying to encourage people to look to the Lord. If that's the case and you're suffering, well then, you know, that, that just, that's okay. It says, verse, verse 17, For this the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it first begin at us, what should the end of them that obey not the, go the gospel of God? Hey, you know, when judgment comes, judgment should begin with those who follow Christ. Lastly, what we see in verse 19. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him that in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. The last thing we need to do is entrust our suffering to God. Sometimes we need to say, God, you know, I've evaluated this and I, I just don't know. I don't know why I'm saying, but Lord, I tr entrust to you that you will use it in the way you see fit in me. And he's saying, hey, let them not uh, suffer according to the will. Let them, let them not suffer according to the will of what? Of God. Commit <coughs> the keeping of their souls to the Creator. But sometimes when you're going through a difficult time, you just say, God, I, I don't know why. I, Evaluated this. I looked at this thing. I'm trying to be joyful in this, but I'm just going to trust that you know more than I do. Mm -hmm. And I don't really. It just doesn't make sense to me. But I'm trusting that one day, and I'm just going to walk with you, and I'm just going to trust you, and I'm going to follow you in spite of what I'm going. Because you know what often happens when we go through a difficult time and we, we evaluate and say, well, well, it's not my fault. I'm just doing it. Hey, wait a minute. This thing of following Christ is not worth it. I'm just going to give up. And I can tell you that's the worst possible thing we can do. We shouldn't trust God who knows best. And God is working something in me that I don't understand. Or maybe God's allowing me to go through this because he's going to put me in a place that I'm going to come in conflict with someone somewhere that needs the Lord, and I would have never been there had I not gone through this. And, and I'm just going to trust God that you know what's best, and that you're working all things out for good, and that you're going to work this out, and you're going to get glory from this. I think you're we'll turn to Psalm chapter 31. Psalm chapter 31, verses 1 to verse 5. This idea of entrusting to God says, In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in thy righteousness. Bow down thine ear to me. Deliver me speedily. Be thou my strong rock for a house of defense to save me. For thou art my rock and my fortress. Therefore, thy for thy name's sake, lead me and guide me. Pull me out of the net that they have laid privily for me. Thou art my strength. Into thy hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God. You know what sometimes? 
that's just a good prayer in some way. say, God, I'm just going to trust you. I'm just going to put my life in your hands. And whatever it is that I'm going through, I'm going to realize, hey, God will use it in some way. And so I don't know what, what's going on in your life to this, to this day, and I don't know what we're going to walk through. And Wouldn't it be nice if we knew what we were going to walk through? And what we don't. But can I encourage you? As we, as we all live the Christian life, as we all encounter suffering, let's expect it. Let's exalt or let's rejoice and give glory to God in it. Let's evaluate it in our lives and see what is there and, and, and see if we can, if it's our fault, if we can confess and make it right and those sort of things. And through it all, let's just trust God. Let's just say, God, you've given me this life. I am giving it to you. I want to bring honor and glory to you. And whatever it is that you're trying to teach me through this, will you help me see and understand so I can follow you and I can know you more and I can be more like you. And then maybe through this, you can use it to help me to reach more people. <coughs> so, when Christians suffer, yep, it happens. But how are you going to react to it? Father, we come before this morning. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this challenge, this reminder from Peter. Lord, may those of us that are here, may, that know you as our Savior, Lord, may we live a life and be willing to entrust you with all that we have. May we follow you no matter what takes place. Lord, be if there are anyone here that knows you as your Savior, Lord, may today they trust you as your Savior because I don't know how anyone could suffer without knowing you without being able to entrust their life to you, without being able to know that you are working and it's part of the process of forming us to you, of giving us hope in you. And we give the praise and the glory for all that you're doing. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
evening. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. Anyways, uh, if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, you'd like to know how you can know for sure uh, that your sins are forgiven, you have a home in heaven, please see me. I'd be glad to take a Bible and show you that. Is there any other way that I can be a help to you? I'll be by the welcome table just outside the door there. And I just stop by and I'd be glad to help you in any way that I can. Look forward to seeing you back tonight, 5 o'clock, uh, for the evening service. And then also, if you're able to help out with Tommy at all next week, please see my wife so that way she can uh, help you out. I know um, <coughs> Pete and Linda are going to be helping with him and all that kind of stuff. And uh, we really appreciate uh, church family that can do that and uh, give us that time. Um, and I think at morning tea there was a cake that Katie made. If there's any cake left over and you want some after church, feel free to have some cake, I guess. If there's any, I don't know. They never saw it. Uh, uh, but anyways, so it's there. Uh, but look, look forward to seeing you back tonight. Father, thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the you have. Lord, to be here. And Lord, I pray that help us to go from this place. Lord, that we rejoice in what you're doing in our life, even if it's a difficult thing. And Lord, may we allow you to work in our lives. Lord, may we trust you through the process. And may we fall close to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.